Fifteen states of the Nigerian Federation today officially joined as plaintiffs in a suit at the Supreme Court challenging the constitutionality of the laws establishing the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, that's the EFCC. The Kogi state government, through its attorney general, had dragged the federal government to the apex court to challenge the powers of the EFCC, as well as any of its anti-corruption agencies to investigate, arrest, or even prosecute in respect of the administration of funds belonging to the states. Now, Undo State, Edo Oyo Ogun, Nasarawa, Kebi, Katsina, Sokoto, Jigawa, Enugu, Benue, Anambra, Plateau, Cross River, and Niger states have applied to join as plaintiffs. It is the position of the plaintiffs that the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission Establishment Act runs contrary to the Constitution, the Constitution uh, which is supreme law. Hence, the FCC's act to be declared nullity. Now, joining me in the studio to discuss this is a legal practitioner, Evan Sofedi. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And good very evening. Much. Very well. Good evening. All right. Um, I mean, you, of course, uh, listened to the intro and yes. the fact that um, some states are not comfortable with the establishment of the uh, EFCC. They, yes. according to them, feel that that agency is unconstitutional. You seem to share that line of thought. Why is that? Well, I share that thought to the extent that the, if you look at the formation of the EFCC in Joseph Mobike versus uh, the Federal Republic of Nigeria, the Supreme Court actually laid the definition of how EFCC came into existence. It came into existence as a result of the UN Convention Against Corruption. Okay, by section 36 of that law, you will find how that the EFCC Establishment Act is actually that convention that influenced it. So it's just um, the National Assembly reduced that convention to the EFCC Establishment Act in 2023, 2024. Okay, and when you look at section 12 of the 1999 Constitution, you know, it says that whenever a law okay, is made pursuant to a convention or an international uh, treaty, you know, once the National Assembly come up with that law, it requires the state House of Assemblies concurrence, okay, to bring it to life. Okay, as at the time the ESCC establishment acts. I'm sorry, I, I would like to come in there. You said it requires the State House, House of, of Assembly con concurrent. Does it, does it mean the State House of Assembly across states? Yes, across the state. The State House of Assembly, the most com majority must concur mm. to the law. Anytime you are ratifying a treaty or a, a law that is influenced by an international law in the country, Section 12 of the Constitution says that that particular law mm. must go to the National Assembly and the concurrence of the state houses of assembly. But it's critical. I, is, it's is, is, is the National Assembly not an offshoot of the state? The National Assembly is the federation, the federal government. Mm -hmm. That's the federal government. Yes, yes. You know, when you want to amend the Constitution, mm. the National Assembly will make its input, and the state house of assembly mm -hmm. will pass it down to them for their concurrence. Mm. That is the states now, yes, the regions, yes. uh, concurring. Definitely. Now, there are only two circumstances under our law. Circumstances under our law where you do that. One is when you amended the Constitution. And two, post one to Section 12 of the Constitution, where an international law has influenced a municipal law, mm -hmm. or an international law has been reduced to a municipal law, okay, for you to pass that, the National Assembly alone cannot do that. It has to follow the concurrence of, of the state the status of assembly. Uh, section 12, subsection 3 of the 1999 Constitution has amended. Mm. You can check that. Mm. Okay? You know that section 12 to subsection 2 of the 1999 Constitution empowers the National Assembly to make laws outside the legislative exclusive list for the purposes of ratifying treaties. Okay? But the addition now came in section 12, subsection 3, where it now says that the concurrence of the state of assembly is required. In the case on that reference, the concurrence of the state house of assembly was not sought and obtained. And so that leaves the EFCC as an the EFCC establishment as, as an incoherent law, a law that is not fully formed. 
and the, the not case fully formed. Yes, the case of the applicants or the plaintiff in this is that on the basis of that inchoate nature, the ESC should be scrapped. Okay? Because a, a, an agency of government, okay, that is not properly constituted cannot fight corruption. Hmm. Cannot, because in UAC versus Mark Boyd, Long Denning said, in law, if a matter is void, and law is a nullity, as you cannot put something on nothing and expect it to stand, it will collapse. So when you look at the establishment out of the EFCC, you look at their functions and objectives. It does not matter how long they have been in existence. Once they are not properly constituted, they are not properly constituted. And the law, the principles of law are that where you have a defect, he who comes to equity must come with clean hands. You must be properly constituted before you can derive authority and power to make corrections in society. You understand? Mm -hmm. So they have laid down their case. Part of their prayers also is that when the federal government have deployed funds to the state by the derivation principle, the government have no right under any guise, EFCC, NFIU, or whatsoever, to teleguide those resources to determine how it is spent or used. Because upon the deployment of those funds to the state by constitutional compliance, the federal government divests itself of those funds. Part of their prayer is that the federal government have no such right under any guise to come tele uh, teleguide those. Well, now the Supreme Court is going to rule on it, okay? But the truth is that we must talk but about. Isn't that uh, a gaffe in the law? Because I mean, we are talking about accountability here. So how, if the federal government, in a way, cannot uh, monitor how these uh, funds are used? If you talk about federal, so, so how 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 does accountability? You know, no, if you talk play about out here. If, yeah, if you talk about federalism under a federal system of government, the autonomy of the state. Okay, just that in the country, so many things are messed up in terms of um, uh, operations and guidelines. Ordinarily, the states are supposed to be the ones, you know, taking care of their resources, getting it directly from source and contributing to the center. But in this case, we have a lopsided one where the federal government is the one in charge of everything and they deploy to the state. So when you deploy to the state, a federal state, uh, sorry, a state that is autonomous and independent, their argument, whether right or wrong, is that the federal government diverts itself of that fund and should not come under any guys to tell guide it. Let the Supreme Court rule on it and let's see what it is. But as to the issue of the constitution of the EFCC, if you look at it from all angles, the constitution of section 12 must be complied with. Because as we speak, it has not been complied with. And then the organization cannot continue to subsist in that era. So perhaps the EFCC should be reconstituted or go the way of the prayers of the 15 state that I described. In which case, Every conviction it has secured from the day it started operation and every case it has undertaken and ongoing will be invalid. So that's the implication of that, this? Yeah, that is the implication. So people, if, so if, if the Supreme Court declares it not properly formed, it will mean that all its actions, memo that quad non habet, you cannot give what you don't have. If you are not properly constituted, you cannot operate like an institution that is properly constituted but, but, under the law. But, but uh, Barrister, uh, I mean, Ophelia, th this feels more like a political grievance than you know, an actual uh, constitutional issue. Because we know that Kogi State in question uh, amongst this state has a, a pending case with its uh, former governor and the FCC. In recent times, we've seen uh, the very, will I use the word messy? Because I know at some point we even had the spokesperson for the EFCC mm. on News Central speak on this matter, yeah. right? And uh, it looks like, um, uh, in a way, the governor is doing, the former governor, that is, is doing everything to avoid, you know, uh, his case. But the EFCC, that's what it seems like. No, no, anyway. no, no. It, it, it's not about the feud. There are a lot of persons who have said that. 
that the field is the reason why Kogi State is heading this, I mean, pushing forth for it. But whether or not it's a field, the truth is that there's a contravention somewhere. You understand? It does not matter what inspires it. Whatever the piece one person says, vendetta. Some people say, by the way, the man himself was at the office sometime. I don't know what they did with him, but I'm not interested in that. What I'm interested in is that, is the EFCC properly formed by law, by the principles of law? Because if not, we must correct it at some point, if not now, in the future, we must correct it. Because if you look at uh, Joseph Mobike versus the Federal Republic of Nigeria, the Supreme Court defined the formation of EFCC, and that is a precedent itself, wherein it properly defined it as the offshoot or the National Assembly only reduced that convention to an EFCC establishment act. That is what it is. It is what it's what brought it to life. All member states were asked to go from to go come up with that institution to ensure that they're able to take care of economic and financial crime. And that is what happened. But when we now promulgated it through the National Assembly, we didn't carry the State House of Assembly together. And part of their, their part of their argument is that by virtue of the fact that their concurrence was not sought and obtained, they are holding on to section 12 of section 3 of the 1999 Constitution, stating that the Constitution made an express provision that their concurrence is required. That why should the EFCC come investigate states that did not have the concurrence in its formation, mm. and that is required by law. But, but let's, let's move away uh, slightly from the constitutionality of its establishment, and let's look at the, will I use the word impact and contribution, if at all, of the EFCC, yeah. particularly in stemming uh, corruption in the country. Over the years, I mean, would you say the EFCC has sort of uh, uh, been that watchdog? Maybe not totally but has created a sense of consciousness that, look, the eagle is watching. You cannot just uh, uh, embezzle funds or mismanage funds because there is some level of accountability you know, uh, to it. I, I do not quarrel with that. I mean, the EFCC have done fantastically well. OK, we've seen how they've been able to recover funds. We've seen how they have gone about their operations, um, especially in their early days. When, what, do you, what, what about now? Yeah, because they are weaker now. They were better and stronger when they first started. If you compare that to now, there, are, there, are, a lot, a lot of, there are a lot of allegations now. I mean, do you know that in the EFCC, because of an issue, one operator had to kill the other because of uh, some corrupt tendencies? Apart from Rubadu and the Waziri, every other leader of the EFCC have been brought, taken down by corruption, by issues of corruption allegations. Mm. From the spending in Hajj to everywhere. I, I mean, it's public knowledge. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, I mean, they, they, nobody can prosecute me for saying the <laughs> truth. Okay, it's public knowledge. They are not as strong as they used to be. They started very well. But they some also will claim that uh, they, were, they were victims of a uh, political um, well, tornado. They, they are still working. They mm. are still doing what they ought to do. But, I mean, they discuss not about their efficiency or otherwise, whether in the past or in the present. I don't think that is the discourse. The discourse is. Their formation. Okay, is their formation proper before the law? It, it, did they come into existence by the strict principles laid down by the Constitution as to how such an organization should come into existence? That's the question. And that is not in the affirmative, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the, the court, the matter is in court, so um, we can make comments about it. We cannot preempt the court or what the court will do. Mm. That, is, that is wrong. But we can talk about it, and the media can talk about it. By Section 22 of the 1999 Constitution, the media is empowered to uh, hold government accountable to the people. Then um, bystanders and people of interest can make commentaries on issues in court, but must not preempt the verdict. OK, so what are doing here is proper, as far as I'm concerned. Now, it's left for the EFCC to file a defense to that effect to prove or disprove the plaintiffs and establish the validity of their existence, existence by law and compliance. So when the court looks at the court to take a decision to that effect. All right. Um, at this point, let's go on a quick break. When we return, we'll definitely pick up. Do stay with us. 
Many thanks for staying with us. This, of course, is still Politics HQ on News Central Television. At this time, we are looking at, of course, a case uh, filed by about 15 states in Nigeria at the Supreme Court challenging the legality of the formation of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. I still have with me my guest, Evan Tufeli. He joins me physically in the studio. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. All right. Um, we're pressed for time on this first half. So uh, in 30 seconds, let's look at the implication of this. On the EFCC, should this case, you know, um, should the Supreme Court say, you know what, thumbs up, um, the EFCC should, it's not legal, what will that be? What implication will it have? What ripple effect are we the, looking the, at? The, the, and what do you suggest as maybe a way forward to make it, it will, the better? Court, the court will definitely make consequential orders as to what they should do. You understand? The powers of the National Assembly have to go back to work and then uh, go, uh, you know, repromulgate that law. But that is if they will get enough states to concur mm. now that there's a dispute. Because, I mean, these states I see that are in court already, they are, they are already off it. How many states do we have left? <laughs> so just by hindsight, I, whatever it is that will come up for me is that the National Assembly will have to go back to work because they are the ones who make, make laws, really. And as long as Section 12 of the Constitution is still there in the Constitution, Section 12 of Section 3, they have to comply with state concurrence, state House of Assembly. And if they get the required number to third majority, then it will pass. It validly pass. Okay, but what we have now is an incoherent uh, law that is not fully formed, that requires a uh, some kind of rework. Mm. Yeah. All right. Evan Sofeli, thank you so much for your time on the program. My pleasure. And uh, thank you for your insight. My pleasure.